Welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. We'll guide you through the ups and downs of note investing and teach you all about the nitty gritty details of the business that other people won't talk about. Your host, Dan Deppin, is a former aerospace engineer and product manager who transitioned away from cubicle life to full time note investing in 2018. Our website is www.fusionnotes.com, where you can subscribe to this podcast, comment, and find links to other information on note investing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Deppin. And in this episode, I'm going to be going over some case studies. I think it's been a few months since I've done any case studies. I had a number of note deals that I exited a couple months ago. And these are some case studies I've been meaning to get to for a while. I've got three that I'm going to share in this episode, but I've actually got a number of others, deals that I can write up case studies on as well. Case studies are something I get a decent number of requests for, so I wanted to try to catch up with some of these. If Always feel free to send me an email and give me some feedback, because if you'd like to see more of these, I've certainly got others that I can do up for you. And what I was trying to do in these three, too, is give kind of a representative sample of what I've seen. So a lot of my deals, I'm generally trying to buy non-performers, which have what I call signs of life, where there's a at least a decent chance of being able to get them to re-perform. And generally, from what I've seen so far under a pretty decent number of deals, I get them to re-perform about two-thirds of the time. And I'm getting a decent sample now, too, where I'm getting an idea of what the returns are in those other scenarios. And the ones I'm sharing here are fairly representative of what I've been seeing. But basically, if you get them to re-perform, then I tend to do very well. And it's kind of nice because you're just holding the loan. You're not having to deal with REOs and all of those other kinds of things. But when you do end up having to take the property back, that's where I see a lot of variance in outcome. And actually, at the end here, I'm going to show one where there was some misfortune and kind of got sideways on. Most people don't share case studies like that, but but I'm willing to do that. Because I think it's important to give everyone a good idea of the reality of what happens in these note deals so you can kind of understand what to expect, right? So I want these to be realistic and real life. I'm not just cherry picking the best case studies that I have. So let's get into it. So this first one, it was in Concord, North Carolina, and all three of these that I'm going to share are were contracts for deeds, okay? So this one's in Concord, North Carolina. I kind of like this area partially because my parents live about 30 minutes or so from here, and my dad's a retired handyman. And so it's always kind of nice to have somebody relatively nearby, close nearby. So if it does turn into an REO, I've got someone that can coordinate with vendors and help make sure things happen correctly. So as I mentioned, it was a contract for deed. The unpaid, and I'll try to talk through the numbers kind of slowly. I know some people are just listening on audio, so I'll try not to get too down in the weeds on the numbers. But if you are more interested in those, you can watch this on YouTube where you can stop and pause it and and go through more of the data. But the unpaid balance was a little under 29,000. The BPO that I had was for 40,500, which was a 30-day quick sale kind of at the lower range of where I like to see the BPOs. But I was a little more willing to do that in this case because I had my dad nearby who I knew could help out with some things if needed. The P&I was 272, which is not super high, but it's good enough. And the loan was 10 months behind when I bought it. But what I liked about it was that it had had eight payments in the last 12 months. So this is the kind of loan that's really in kind of squarely in my Wheelhouse. I mean, typically, if a borrower's made eight payments in the last 12 months, there's a really good chance you're going to be able to get this reperforming. Now, it's not always the case because I've definitely had ones that I bought like this where they did not reperform, but most of the time they will. And it was a two bed, one bath, 850 square foot house. So, also on the smaller side, that was part of the reason for the lower value. So, one of the things I like to do when I do these case studies is go back and start by reviewing what I thought the ROI was going to be going into the deal. It's always kind of fun when you get these actual exits and then you go back and look at what your estimates were. I've been doing a lot of that over the last few months. It's really helpful for getting your ROI model and your expectations kind of dialed in. 
So I bought the note for 14300 which is about 49% of UPB, kind of typical for a non-performing. I like that price a lot, considering that there were eight payments in the last 12. I have a lot of these where I've paid more than that for similar loans. Bought this in November of 2018. And at the time, when I was doing my ROI estimates when I bought this, I was assuming that if I got it reperforming, I would be able to sell it for 75% of the unpaid balance. I've since adjusted that a little bit. Now I use 70% just because that seems to be where the market is. It's a very interesting thing I find where it seems like prices for performing CFDs, I don't know if my original expectations were just too high or if they've gone down, but they don't always sell for as much as you would expect. They Performing CFDs sell for really high yields. Likewise, pricing for non-performing CFDs is so it's almost like the pricing between a non-performing CFD and a performing CFD have almost kind of munged close <laughs> together. I can't quite explain overall. That's why I've tilted these days to buying a lot of performing contract for deeds and then just doing partials or hypothecating loans against them. But anyways, that's kind of a detour that doesn't have anything really to do with this case study. But that 75% of UPB was my assumption when I went in. And the way everything shook out, I was anticipating a 42% ROI with 21% to the joint venture partner. Now that's the total ROI, assuming, you know, so I'm not going to dive into all the numbers here because it's a little hard to do on a podcast, but the purchase price of the note plus the workout expenses, and then assuming that we would get the borrower on some kind of forbearance agreement and trial payment plan where there would be a down payment, a certain number of payments, roll and reining arrearages into the loan, and then resell the loan for that 75%. And then it just so worked out that in the case where I had to do a forfeiture, the ROIs were exactly the same. So about 42% overall, 21% to the JV partner. That was kind of coincidence on this one. That's not typical that it works out that way. So bought the loan, and then the loan transfer took about six weeks, which isn't unheard of. That's slower than I would like, but it kind of is what it is sometimes. I've had loan transfers take like two and a half months before. That's why it's really important to stay on top of the servicers, both servicers, when you're doing a transfer. Because I've seen these sometimes just kind of fall in a black hole and take way too long. And that really eats in to your timeline. Now, this was a case where I got really fortunate on this one where the borrower made, I think it was a $1,000 payment right after I bought the loan. So that was kind of cool because they were not crazy far behind before. And this started to get them closer to caught up. And this is before we even really reached out to them. So I used players counselors for the borrower outreach. They got a hold of the borrower, talked to them. Didn't really give a reason for following behind, but said that they wanted to stay in the house, wanted to get caught up. That $1,000 payment was part of trying to get caught up. And so we were able to put a forbearance agreement in place. And so since the borrower had already made this $1,000 payment, wasn't really asking for a huge good faith down payment. Normally I would ask for more, but in this case we asked that the borrower just make a one-time down payment of $500 and then make the next six normal payments on time. And then if they fulfill all of that and agree to modify the loan, then when I modify the loans, typically I'm not generally changing the payment or the interest rate. You can do that. What I'm generally doing is agreeing basically to take any leftover arrearages after the trial period, roll those into the balance of the loan, and then extend the term as needed to keep the payment the same. Unless there was like a real problem with the payment, then I might restructure it to change the payment amount. But generally, I don't like to do that. I like to just put the arrearages back into the loan and recapitalize it. So the borrower fell through on the agreement, which wasn't a big surprise since they had already made this other decent sized payment. And then they ended up making payments on time for about 10 or 11 months while I held the loan. And then at the end of September of 2019, modded the loan. Here was another big lesson learned. I was late in modifying the loan. They completed the forbearance agreement. And then I think another two months or so went by before I said, Hey, are you guys ready to modify the loan? That was my bad. And what happens here is right is when you start, I think at the time I had about somewhere between 50, 60 loans. I don't remember the exact timing. It can be real easy for things like that to fall through the cracks. I've since modified my procedures to prevent this from happening. 
So now when I do a forbearance agreement, I know when it should be completed. And so in Pipedrive, which is my CRM, I make a note in there, create an activity. So I get basically an alarm that goes off. So I know to check the loan and see if it's time to do a modification. When I first set this up, I didn't have that process in place. It wasn't a big deal. didn't cost the borrower anything, but it was just kind of a lesson learned for me to make, to put some steps in place to make sure when a loan needs done with the trial payment plan needs to be modified to make sure that that happens. And then sold the loan in November of 2019. So for the total returns, so if you look at the total holding costs that I had on this, I think there might've been some delinquent taxes, but it was 3,186. I had paid 14,300 for the note, ended up selling the note for 21,000. So the profit on the sale of the note itself was just over 4,000. But then because of the $1,000 payment and the good faith down payment and some other things that had come in, there was about $3,572 in interest on payments that were received. So we had a total profit of about seventy six eighty eight. dollars 88 Now, if you look at the total that was spent, so the fourteen three dollars for the note plus the thirty one eighty six dollars for expenses, it was just on short of $17,500. And so I actually ended up with a 44% raw ROI based on what was spent. So that was really great. And that's actually, it's better than normal for a reperformer because of that extra money that came in on the front end. But it's generally when you get these reperforming, you get really good ROIs. 44 is on the high side. Now, from the joint venture partner perspective, so they have a partner on this. So they funded 22,000 because I had asked them to fund expenses for a workout if we had to go through a forfeiture. I've since changed my process a little bit, especially since I have partners now that I've been working with for a while and we've done multiple deals. If I had this to do over, given the characteristics of the loan and the fact that there were eight payments in the last 12, I probably just would have had them fund the reperform scenario with the understanding that they'll fund additional money if we have to go through a forfeiture. But that was the way I did it. So they funded 22000 they got a split of the interest that came in, which was seventeen eighty six, and then a split of the little over four thousand in profits. That was two thousand eight. So they made thirty seven ninety four in profit on their twenty two thousand in funding. So their ROI was seventeen point two. Now that's less than half of the total ROI because the joint venture return on the seventeen point two percent. That's based on how much they funded, which was a lot more than what was actually spent. Okay. But then the real thing I always look at is the annualized return. So they were in the deal for 12 months altogether, and their annualized return ended up being 23.4%. Now, you might ask, how can the annualized return be higher than the actual return if you were in it for 12 months? And that was because I returned $7,000 in principal early, right? So even though I took more in funding than was ultimately needed, once the deal got on track and it got reperforming, I gave them 7000 back that I knew I wasn't going to need. One of the things that I found as I've done more and more of these is, you know, when you're trying to optimize the annualized return to your joint venture partner, when you do get things on track and you can return capital early, it always behooves you to do that because that really can make a big difference in the annualized return. If you just hold on to cash more than you need to, it really hampers your partner's annualized return. So that's something I keep a close eye on. On a quarterly basis, I run reports that I send to my partners and I'm always looking for situations where I can return capital. So I'm not just holding on to that for them. And also some of the interest that came in was paid as as we went. So one of the things when I do those quarterly reports are if a loan is on track and we've been getting payments, then I'll send them half of the interest that's come in on the payments as we go. And all of that helps the annualized return because they're not just getting all the money at the end. They're getting money as we go along. If it works out that that's possible, it's not always possible, but this one it was. So this was a really good deal. Um, this is actually better than typical for a reperformer, but definitely in the range of what I've seen. I've actually had reperformers that have done better than this as well. So that was the one in Concord, North Carolina. So the second one was in Lima, Ohio. 
It's in kind of the central part of the state. Lima, Ohio is known for having the M1 Abrams tank factory. They've been building tanks there since World War II, and I believe it's the only active tank factory right now in the country. So not the biggest town. It's kind of a medium-sized town, but it's got an anchor employer. It's got a, a little, got some other manufacturing and some other things going on. So it's not a bad area. The county is a little smaller. The county government can be a little bit of a pain in the butt to deal with, but not a bad place. And I like this one. If you're looking at the photos, I mean, the property was just in really good shape. Lots of signs of pride of ownership, plants and things. I mean, Roof looking good, siding looking pretty good, paint's okay, American flag, lots of good signs of life here. So this one, the unpaid balance was a little over forty three thousand, and the BPO that I had was over was about sixty five thousand. Okay, so there's some equity in it. Principal and interest was four eighty four, and the loan was twelve months behind, but they had made nine payments in the last twelve months. So this was kind of similar to. The previous one I showed as far as the going in scenario. So my ROI estimates going in up front were, so I bought this loan for seven, little, just over 17,000, which was 39% of unpaid balance. Now I bought this in, I believe it was the middle of 2018. Pricing since then has gone up. I don't think you could buy a loan like this at this price today in 2020. This would probably be more in the ballpark of 50% of UPB, maybe higher. But that's just where the market has kind of shifted. Yeah, I bought this in June of 28th, 2018. That's actually John Elway's birthday. Don't ask me how I know that. So at the time of purchase, and here was another thing too that I did, because I like to explain where I changed things. I was estimating in the worst case foreclosure scenario that there would be about $14,000 in expenses. That's overkill for this, especially a house that looks really good. Something would have to really, really go sideways to get to 14000 So I would not estimate it that high nowadays, but I was being super, super conservative at the time that I did this. So assuming a total of $31,097 invested, given the price of the note plus those expenses, and the loan modification scenario, so again, selling the CFD at 75% of UPB, I was coming up with an ROI of like 56% or 28% to the JV partner. And then the foreclosure, I was getting 48% of ROI or 24% to the JV partner. These expenses were way too high. The price that I was selling the contract for deed for that I was assuming was pretty aggressive. So if I was doing this again and doing this today, I would lower that. And then in the foreclosure scenario, I would have estimated a lower proceeds from the sale because I find that when you actually take properties back, what you sell them for is always less than your BPO. So I just want to point out where I would be making adjustments versus when I did this actually almost two years ago now. So the loan transfer, got that transferred over, used Polaris again for the borrower outreach. They were able to make contact with the borrower. The borrower was pretty agreeable. He was a truck driver and said he had been out of work for a while and that's why he fell behind, but he was working again. And then um, there was also a divorce. That was part of the issue as well. So his ex-wife was on it. We um, ended up updating the loan to take her off of it. She wanted nothing to do with it. So it sounded like during this whole upheaval of the job thing and going through the divorce, it took him a little while to get the ship righted, which he had since done. So we got a forbearance agreement in place. So he agreed to make a one-time good faith down payment of $1,000 and then make the next six payments on time. And that one-time payment, which we call a good faith down payment, is really important for making sure that the borrower has skin in the game, right? I mean, we don't want to get into a scenario. If the borrower is not putting any skin in the game, then it's very easy for them to say, yeah, yeah, I'll sign your forbearance agreement and then just flake out on it and not follow through with it. And then that delays when you can start your legal process. So we got that $1,000 and then structured this the same as the other one. So said, okay, once the agreement's complete, We'll take any remaining arrearages, roll those into the balance of the loan, and extend the term as needed. And the other point, too, I like doing that is when you're putting the arrearages in the loan, right? Whenever we're pricing, we're always pricing based off of the unpaid balance, even though the payoff amount might be higher because they're behind or because, you know, maybe the lender has paid taxes on behalf of the borrower and that's been added as a charge. But what's nice is when you do the modifications where you're rolling 
the balance in, then at the end of the modification, your unpaid balance is higher. So when you're selling it at 70 or 75 cents on the dollar, you're recouping some of that amount. So we went, so we completed the forbearance of the trial payment plan, modified the loan in June of 2019. And then right after modified the loan, the guy missed two payments, which made me want to scream. That's not completely unheard of for this to happen. It's really annoying because you're kind of starting back over a little bit with with pay history. Did get him paying again and then actually sold the loan in November of 2019. So still kind of did okay in the sale. Would have done better had the borrower not missed those payments right off the bat. He claimed there were some job issues and whatnot. Sometimes I think borrowers get, and this is just me speculating, but I almost had the impression he thought, okay, we've made these payments, completed this mod, or completed this trial payment plan, and now it's been modified, now I'm done, right? I mean, sometimes I've run into scenarios where borrowers had another loan somewhat recently where we were going through the legal process, the borrower made a couple large payments to get me to stop the foreclosure, made like $4,000 in payments. I said, great. And then he immediately stopped making payments again. It's like sometimes borrowers think they're done <laughs> and they don't realize like, it's like, okay, the foreclosure stopped. That's great. But they don't realize like, okay, no, you have to continue to keep making payments. So who knows why he missed those two? It's always hard to say. And um, just because borrowers tell you a reason, that doesn't mean that was actually the reason, right? But we did get the loan sold. So when we look at the returns, our total holding costs ended up being $3,714. There was a $500 loan mod fee that we did through Madison. And because of missing the two payments, it drug things out a little bit. There's some additional borrower outreach. But I ended up selling the note for $26,839. So actually the profit on the sale, when you can consider, the way I do the accounting on these is you break up the principal and interest on every payment. So when I'm calculating the profit on the sale, I'm actually taking what I paid for the note minus the principal portions of the payments that came in. I don't want to deep dive too hard on that right now. Maybe I'll do another podcast later where I talk about why you split principal and interest and some of the accounting and how that works. I could also maybe have Debbie Mullins come on at one time. She's my bookkeeper who sets all this up for me. Um, But anyways, the profit on the sale was just over $7,500. And then there was little over 3500 in interest on payments that had come in. So the, oops, my number on my slide is wrong. Oh no, I forgot to update this. Okay, so I messed up my slide on that part. But the JV side, I got right. But anyhow, this was a, let me see if I can do this off the top of my head. So we're into the note for 17000 for the note, 37 in holding costs, about 21000 in total costs. And then had sale proceeds of 26 plus 3, about 30. Yeah, so it was actually, ROI-wise, this was up well over 40 in this case. The JV funding, so they funded a little over 31,000. They received 2,200 in payments along the way. And then another 3,700 in change in the profit split. So they ended up seeing just under 6,000 in profits. So their JV ROI, raw ROI was 19.2%. And then this was over 15 months. And then the annualized return ended up being 16.1%. So pretty steady. This is kind of typical for a reperformer. I did pay some of the interest early, but I did not return expenses as early as I should have. Again, this was one before I had adjusted some of my processes where I wasn't quite as fanatical about trying to return money early where I can. I did give them the $6,000 back in December of 2018, but really that was, I should have done that sooner. And then another 7,000 back in May of 2019. So that kind of helped the return overall. So there were, and then two things here as an operator that I would do differently, that, that I would do differently if I had to do over that would have helped the partner's annualized return. One would be not asking for so much funding up front. I mean, for one, that $14,000 estimate was kind of ridiculously conservative, which I mean, if you got to err, erring on the side of conservative is not such a bad thing, but my cost estimate would have been under 10,000 had it to do over. And then given the parameters on the loan, I probably would have asked the partner just to fund the reperforming scenario instead of the whole forfeiture scenario. 
And if I had done this, I would have returned some of that reserve for expenses earlier. And so if I had this to do over, I probably could have gotten their annualized return from 16.1%. I probably, I might've been able to make it go over 20, maybe just theoretical, but uh, it's always good to revisit these and look at, you know, what you were thinking up front, how they actually happened, what you actually did, what mistakes were made, and then look at how you can improve these over time. All right. And now the last one, now the sideways one. This was another contract for D. This was in Jackson, Mississippi. So the unpaid balance was thirty-six thousand. The seller provided a BPO of eighty-five thousand. My BPO for the thirty-day quick sale came in at fifty-five thousand. So quite a difference there. Not shocking that a seller would give you a high BPO. That's it's kind of lame that people do that. And the guy I bought this from is particularly lame, but that's just the way it goes sometimes. Did have thirty-three hundred in delinquent taxes as well. The guy I bought this from is somebody who just doesn't believe in paying delinquent taxes. And the the loan was 22 months behind, and there had been one payment in the last 12 months. So there was a little bit of signs of life, but this was one that definitely had a higher probability of going through the forfeiture process. You know, but there was a decent amount of equity in it. I felt like my BPO was pretty conservative, and so I was comfortable with the value, and that's why I like this one. And the rental rates were pretty high. In the area as well. I had a rental rate estimate of 895. In this particular area in Jackson, too, I talked to some realtors. There are a lot of rental properties in the area, and they said there were a lot of active fix and flippers. So I felt this was one I was kind of comfortable taking back if I had to. My ROI estimate so bought the note for 22,700, so 62% of unpaid balance. Um, this was one that was in the 2019 when um, pricing was a good bit higher. Bought this at the end of April 2019. And at the time of purchase, assumed if I could get this modified and sell the loan at 75% of unpaid balance, that there would be about a 27% ROI or 14% to the JV partner. But then if I had to go through the forfeiture, I was looking at worst case expenses of 11900 A lot of that was the 3300 in property taxes that were owed. So it's kind of like roughly 8000 plus taxes. And assuming that we sold it for 50,000. So being conservative, right? So the seller had a BPO of 85. My BPO, my quick sale BPO was 55. So I said, okay, we'll knock that down by about 10%. Sell it for about 50, net 45. And that would be about a 30% ROI or about 15% to the JV partner. So targeting ROIs that were lower on this one than some of the others, but felt like there was good equity in the property that I was protected in that way. Now, the loan transfer and the loss mitigation. So I use Polaris again for the borrower outreach. And it's it's always funny when Polaris makes contact with the borrower. You know, they're very good at coming back and kind of giving you the story, whether there was a, they kind of, sometimes they come back and say, hey, this borrower had these hiccups. They really want to get back on track. I think they're sincere. Or, hey, they told me thing, they told me this and that. And I don't know how much I trust them. This one, Polaris came back and said, this is one angry, bitter woman. And they basically said, we can't work with this person, which is funny because Polaris is a nonprofit. And Andy, who I work with there, is like one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. So when they kind of come back and say, yeah, this person's a hard case, you know they are. That doesn't really happen too often. So I ended up actually having several phone calls with the borrower because what I really want to do is give it, if there's any chance to get the note to reperform or work out a deal or a deed in lieu. I really want to run that to ground. So I ended up having a couple of phone calls with the lady, tried to get things going, and there was just nothing happening. I mean, basically, she was not interested in doing anything. She, You could tell she was pretty untrustworthy, and she just kind of blaming previous owners of the notes for various things. And I think when it came down to it, too, you know, and I tried to explain to her in a nice way, too, right? When I buy these, now this loan had been bought and sold a couple times. And that's pretty normal for a lot of these contract for deeds that are that are on the secondary market. What some people do is they'll buy loans, try to do a workout. If it doesn't work, resell the loan. And sometimes borrowers kind of get conditioned to expect that. You could tell when I explain to her, I'm like, I want to work something out with you, but if we can't, I'm going to go take it through the forfeiture process. I don't think she believed me. And then she made weird threats to sue which weren't really clear. And she was kind of saying, oh, no, 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 this thing is has problems. You're not going to be able to do it, which 
no, I think I did my due diligence. The title's clear, clear path. I know how the rules work in Mississippi. But anyhow, it just became clear there was no deal possible. I mean, I kind of ended with her saying, well, when I leave, I'm taking the the air conditioner, I'm taking the water heater, I'm taking the carpet. She had kind of talked like she had put a lot of money into this property. And so I said, okay, well, we'll see what happens, right? So I started the legal process, sent out the notice of demand, filed the complaint, and then got to the hearing. And then when my attorney went to the hearing, he ended up talking to the borrower and the borrower said, hey, I'm done with this. I moved out. And she basically just signed off on the loan at that point. So we didn't actually technically complete the forfeiture. It's always a weird thing when borrowers, I've had this before where borrowers are what I call hard cases. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'm done. I'm out. So anyways, that's what happened. Now we get to the REO portion, which is always where all of the brain damage happens. Now I've got a vendor I've used for some of my REOs. They're a nationwide. They're a vendor that kind of covers REOs nationwide. What I, And I'm not going to say who this vendor was. What I do, and there, and there are other vendors who do this. What I kind of like about them is you can hand them REOs off to them and they will kind of take care of everything. So they'll get it secured, get a BPO, get it listed. They work with local agents. If there are repairs needed, they can coordinate those. And it's kind of one-stop shopping. And I had done a couple other REOs with this vendor where they did a really good job. This one, they basically cracked the bed big time. So they said they got it secured right away. I found out later that it wasn't really secured. They changed the locks, but I had somebody just walk right in to the property. And it took me literally like six weeks to get the BPO and the photos because they said that their agent crapped out on them and they were having trouble finding another agent. And they just kind of had excuse after excuse. And I was really getting worried. I'm like, what is going on with this? My skin always crawls when I have an REO and I don't know exactly what's happening on the ground. So six weeks later, they go through a couple agents. They finally get me the BPO and they said the house is in rough shape and they gave me a quick sale value of 30,000 and a 35,000 90 day value. So I don't want to gloss over that, right? So going into this deal, seller gave me a BPO of an 85K. My BPO was 55. Now it's 30. (laughs) That's a pretty big jump, right? The difference between 30 and 55 is pretty huge, but it's actually not unheard of. I mean, the reason was the condition of the property was really poor. So there was some roof damage, the roof was leaking, and there was was a big crack in the middle of the foundation. And there was no water heater, so she stuck true to her word in taking the water heater. Didn't take carpeting, AC I'm not even totally sure, but the issue was the roof and the foundation. And I suspect what happened here, and I've seen this on other deals, when you have a borrower who's a hard case or you can't even get a hold of, And all of a sudden, they're willing to go out of the blue. They're like, okay, I'm ready to leave. Often that means there's something messed up with the house. And in this case, I think it was just because of the roof damage and the foundation issues. The house kind of got to the point where they're like, okay, even I can't live here. So it's something important to keep in mind because when I've run into this on other deals where all of a sudden a borrower was ready to leave, I'm like excited and high-fiving. But that's actually can be kind of a red flag. It could mean something's wrong with that house and it's not really livable. So. If you do run it now, in this case, the borrower just signed off and left after part of the legal process. If you do run into a case where the borrower wants money for a cash for keys, make sure you get that checked out because it could be that something is up. The upside was she did take all of her stuff. So the property was cleaned out, which was really good. Part of those, when I'm estimating expenses for REOs, part of my conservatism is I'm often assuming a couple thousand dollars for a clean out. So I've had multiple $3,000 plus clean outs. Um, on REO. Sometimes these people are pack rats and they leave and they just leave a mess behind. At least this borrower didn't do that. That was like the one saving grace of the whole deal. I ended up selling the property myself. So with my REO vendor, you know, usually they have an agent and they list it and they sell it for you and they have certain fees they collect for that. I was super pissed at that vendor and was not really interested in using them. And I knew somebody in Jackson who I knew was a pretty active investor. They pointed me to somebody else who was a cash buyer and ended up selling it to them for 30000 which was actually better than I thought I was going to do it. First, I was getting offers for like 25000 and I thought I was really going to eat it on this one. So it was 30000 plus they agreed to cover all the closing costs. They do a lot of deals in Jackson's particular outfit that I sold it to and have a title company that they work with. So my net proceeds were actually 29770 which is amazing. That is... 
when I got this back and knew about the roof and the cracked foundation, I really wasn't sure where this was going to end up. So those net proceeds were better than I thought I was going to end up with on my own. And then the other question that came up that was interesting is your vendor relations, right? So, so I didn't use the REO vendor to sell it, which they were upset about. I did pay them for the BPO and the rekey. I could have, I mean, for them to wait six weeks and do that was pretty bad. I mean, I could have handled that differently, but I did do it in such a way that I preserved the relationship with the vendor. I don't know if I'm going to use this vendor again. Odds are probably pretty good that I won't, but this is kind of a small industry and there are really only so many vendors out there. And a lot of times you do run into bad vendors. You know, I do hesitate to go to scorched earth and completely torch the relationship because there are only so many vendors out there. I may want to go back to them later. And I've had issues with other vendors where they've really performed poorly in some cases and then kind of righted the ship. So I have left the door open to use that vendor again. I don't know if I want to or not. I'll kind of cross that bridge down the road when I get to it. But that issue of how you handle vendor relationships is always interesting as well. So so the final return, so my cost basis, so we're into the note for $22,700. Ended up spending a little over $8,200. A lot of that was delinquent taxes and then other taxes that racked up while we were holding it. And then there were the legal fees. So I ended up spending just under 31,000 and recouped just under 30,000. So I ended up losing $1,188 on this one. So yeah, no deals do go upside down. Most people don't talk about them. It's funny when I was at the IMN conference a while back, when you're talking to, um, either individual note investors like me who have been active for a long time or even some of these guys running hedge funds who have been at it for years and years. I heard all kinds of stories of deals going sideways, a lot more sideways than what this one went. So it's just part of the reality of the deal and of the business that these things happen. And so if this does freak you out, if you're like, oh my God, you can lose money on a note deal, then you should, this is not the business for you because they do happen. Right. So the ROI ended up being minus 3.8% from the joint venture partner perspective. So they funded 34,600, lost 1188. So minus 3.4% or an annualized 3.8%. So it's, it's unfortunate. But, you know, as I showed on these, if you look, put this in perspective, right? I mean, if you look at the ones that are reperforming, which usually most more than often than not, they do, right? You know, we're getting these larger, like 15, 20% plus annualized returns, you know, but sometimes you might go negative. It's a pretty good industry to invest in. And also keep in mind, right, that the property, when we took it back, I mean, from the outside, it looked fine, but it had a bad roof and a cracked foundation. Those are two pretty massive things to hit you on one deal and still only lost a couple percent. So while when I talked to some people on the phone and I mentioned hitting a loss, some people completely freak out. If you put it in perspective, it's really not that big a deal. And in the grand scheme of things, I like this range of outcomes, right? Like if I can make 20%, make 20%, lose a few percent, that's not bad overall. And these are looking at it from the perspective of when you have a partner where you're splitting profits, right? I and mean, if you're doing this with your own funds, you can get some really, really solid return. So I think it's always important to keep things in perspective. And again, if you know, somebody's listening to this and they're just completely freaked out by the possibility of any loss, well, then you might want to check out those money markets instead of real estate, right? There are some other investments you might want to look at instead, just just trying to be very straightforward about how the industry works. So that's what I've got for you in this episode. Hope you like those. If you want to see more of them, I've got plenty. Just let me know and I will uh, see you next time. 